generally going to have a pretty well oiled machine of a municipality. If they're run by county council, who get elected every two years, who know nothing about sewer, pipes are out of mind, they're out of sight. You'll see them taking their pictures with fire trucks and the police cars, because that's sexy, but you will never see one out in an SSO. It ain't going to happen. Right. So we try to bring a solution that also you know, stops creating that mayhem. What is a heat trace? A uh, heat trace is heat tape that you can actually wrap around it. It's like a... Um, wrap around what? Uh, the pipes. Oh, okay. And you can we wrap can it around the, the loop. We don't have to worry about that here. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, but if you have, but if you have, if you have a, a, a freezing condition, uh -huh. like an open pump, we, you know, we talk to our contractors that are bypassing in the middle of the winter, say up in Illinois, uh -huh. and we tell them, hey, take the backup pump, drain the volute, because if it freezes overnight, and that pump starts up, it's going to break the shaft. Uh -huh. Or they can put heat trace around the volute, keep the water, you know, at least from freezing. So um, that's an adder or option. The heat trace. Yeah, it's an uh, yeah. Okay. yeah, it's an option we wouldn't need down here, but it, right. it's some, those rare occasions that it does freeze. Like one time we did have a big freeze here, and we had a customer call and said, hey, the pump won't start. Uh, what's it doing? I push the button, it goes click. And it's just because it's, it's locked. No, it's the pump it's locked, locked up. up. Oh, wow. So the starter just, it couldn't turn it because it was locked up. You know, like sometimes it'll snap the shaft, sometimes it'll snap the coupler. But this one was so tight, and everything was so good on it, and so frozen that the starter just wouldn't, couldn't turn it. It couldn't handle that load to try to turn it with the ice, but that impeller was frozen in the back of the pump. But the heat trace, they'll wrap it around the, the balloon and wrap it around the piping so, so that they don't have to worry about any freezing. What was the solution on your example? On uh, Just like the, it was cold and the it was, oh, it's so the starter was locked up. Just, uh, my Way pipe can't pull that, pulled out the suction, so I think the ice. He said, when it melts, it will be good. <laughs> so... Yeah, it, when it finally thawed out, pump fire right up. Nice. So we're thinking of all these things. Like, remember keep me saying this yesterday to the to Brown and Gay. Yeah. If I say it right, right? Is that yeah, who we were? Brown and Gay, you're right. We were talking about so many different things. Like, Julie, where are we? I, I, was, I was getting <laughs> lost. Um, we do all these things to help you protect the client. Mm -hmm. All these, all these decisions we're making are to protect the client, to help the auto, operator. All sustainable type ideas. Sound attenuation, 69 decibels at 30 feet. The best way to describe that, it's like your air conditioning unit turning on outside of your house. It's about that noise level. It's not obscene. It's just kind of a low hum. So it's um, another question, I, and I'm sorry to interrupt. Yep, I don't nope. want to forget. Well, so we're working on a thing down in uh, south of us by Port Lavaca. Their question, the engineer's question, was, can can they get a lower cost on sound attenuated enclosure if they don't make it sound attenuated and it's just a locking cabinet? Or is it going to be the same cost? It, yeah, it's, there's a lot of, uh, we can do a locking, just a cabinet, but it's because there's, there's huge muffler in there. I mean, you've seen the insides of them. They've got all that, all that foam stuff. and stuff, yeah. Um, we can do that. The best thing is just an open unit. Is it going to be behind a fence? It well, they, they don't want open for the security factor. So they wanted a less. They wanted to reduce the price. The reason being is because they already have the budget set up, and they already had generators spec'd, but the engineer is willing to go in and, and ask for uh, the, the government funding entity so, that they're using. He's willing to, he wants to squeeze in the DBS, but he's trying to pinch every penny he can. I understand. It's not a bad question, but when we're mass producing these things, yeah. the right. cost of changing the gauge of the metal, a one-off, right. it's not going to be cost-effective enough. Yeah. You know, that same guy, Greg, you guys are going to kick out of the story. So Greg calls me the week after Clemson and Alabama played the CFP championship in 2016, and he goes, Bruce, i got a question about your pump. And immediately I'm going, shit, we've got a gas problem, we've got a, a fuel issue, we got, you know, what, what's he about to ask? You know how that is. You get, he goes... Does it void the warranty if I change the paint color of your pump? <laughs> and I just started to laugh, and I was like, nah, but I got to know, why do you want to change the color of the pump? He goes, well, the local Mrs. Kravitz, that's the head of the Homeowners Association, just called me, and she said, Greg, I know you said the project is finished, the contractors has paid, and all of his stuff is supposed to be off-site, so... When is that god awful Clemson Orange thing going to get off the job site? <laughs> <laughs> and I just laughed. I said, uh, "I said, just let me put a I paint whatever you want. Let me put a big tiger paw on the side." <laughs> yeah, nice. So we can 
look, if your municipality says we want a green color or a white color or whatever color they want, give us a Sherman Williams paint code and we'll paint it whatever they want. Is that a six hundred dollar adder to do that to change color? Yeah, I think they they or they do added six hundred dollars to the, for paint change, and I've got a template of the same paint we use. It's uh, but we can make it whatever paint, whatever yeah. your client wants, Chuck. We can make it whatever color they want. They want it to blend in brown and green, camouflage. I don't. We don't care. I gotta get. I gotta yes, go knock out a, a quote. Okay. Joey, thank you, thank you for yes, coming sir. Over. Oh, no problem. Appreciate all your I'll support. All right, yes, sir. See you, brother. See you later. I'll, I'll see you. you. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll copy you an email for that public school deal here. Okay. Well. Okay. Okay. I'm, when I get back, I'm gonna I'm gonna check with engineering because we used to make something that was called a vandal pack, and we might still be able to do something similar to that. And it was just a drop over enclosure with a door on it. Like That's there, perfect so. because they're it's out in the middle of Laward and they don't have fencing and they, every penny counts. Which, which model pump have you inspected out yet to know what size? Yes, the NC80. An NC80? Yeah, okay. Small enough, I mean, at three inch. So again, these are flow controls. This I gotta change that slide. There. That'll, oh, it's got the old A91 control panel, um, but you can use the flow controls. The, the prime guard controls on our pumps now can be tied into their SCADA so they can read what the pump is doing. And also our pumps now have field smart te technology. So if they want to see in real time on their phone what the pump is doing, they can see all those, all that type of information from the prime guard uh, control panel. I don't want to spend a ton of time on that. We talked about sound attenuation and, uh, you know, again, how it deafens the noise. So here's the different options. New construction specs require backup pumping capabilities and municipalities, again, are the one, they're the ones driving this change because they're the ones paying for it. <clears throat> List station upgrade is an excellent place. Um, installing a pump instead of increasing the size of the generator, instead of saying you've got to have this big generator for the, um, you know, the, because the, the, when a generator starts, you've got a, um, a, a starting amp draw and then you get to running amp draw uh, whereas a pump was it's just going to react to what the water's doing it's just going to be designed to match the flow of the submersible pumps um, increased station reliability we, we knew of a station in Rock Hill South Carolina where they said we need to upgrade because both pumps were running all the time so it was no longer a duplex station they said you need to change this but they knew that within 10 months that the station was going to go away to a gravity line for something else they were building. Why upgrade the whole station and put that in? They said, what if we bought a trailer-mounted Godwin pump and put it in, and, and the South Carolina uh, EPA said, uh, yeah, that'll work. We'll, uh, um, or South Carolina DEC, they said, that'll work. Now it'll be a duplex station. Flight pumps run. You get a high flow, peak flow, whatever. You, get, you got a backup. The orange pump can run. Let me, this is where I'm going with this with your question on Final Tier 4 technology. So years ago, this is the cliff notes on Final Tier 4 technology. Years ago, EPA and lawyers and lobbyists in DC said, we've got to reduce our carbon footprint with emissions and diesel engines. So they came up with a Tier 2 engine that reduced the emissions by this much and the cost went up this much. And then they said, well, let's do it some more. We think we can do better. So they went to Tier 3 and they reduced emissions by this much and the cost went up this much. And then there was an interim Tier 4 where they reduced emissions this much and the cost still went up just a little bit. Final Tier 4 technology, cost went up, diesel engines, 40%. And the reduced emissions was this much. It's a, it's a science project nightmare between EPA lawyers and lobbyists. I can't get around it. So here's the deal. If they buy a, a diesel pump that's road going or skid mounted, it's portable. Keyword is portable pump. Either one, that pump has to have final tier four technology. If the pump is skid mounted and classified when it goes out our gate as emergency standby pump, just like a generator says emergency standby generator, that engine is classified to be grandfathered in at tier three where it doesn't have all of that technology. So an interesting thing. You've heard of, have you guys heard of load banking? On generators? Yeah. 
So what they do with the, uh, with the generator is it exercises every week, right? It's running for 20 minutes, doesn't transfer power, but it's run. We know it runs. We know the generator is going to run when we need it, right? All that running and never transferring power, never putting a load on that alternator end of the generator produces carbon buildup on the cylinder, top of the cylinder engine. So when they load bank it, the first thing they do is they run it at 25% amp draw for an hour. And when they do it, it looks like a black cloud of soot skyrocket, you know, just, it's, it's a display and chunks, I mean chunks of black soot will come flying out when they do that. And then they'll run it to 50%, then 75%, then 80%. They never put it at 100% load. Why? Because generators are never designed to handle more than 80% load. So for that reason, that's why they load bank those generators. A pump with final tier four technology, just like a generator, has to have a certain amount of load, at least 50% to heat up the partic diesel particulate filter to burn that, those carbons off, or otherwise you get a what's called soot level buildup. When you get to 100%, it can shut that engine off. Mm. Think that's a challenge in a pump, particularly in bypassing? Mm -hmm. Particularly when we're bypassing the gravity at the sewer line. Okay, our average daily flow is 0.8 MGD. Our peak rain flow that you have to have bypassing capacity for in that trunk line, Mr. Godwin, is 10 MGD. So am I going to take a big monster pump that's going to run and potentially soot build up and shut down? Sewer doesn't stop just because the engine stops. So now when we build these pumps for DBS applications at these lift stations, we're going to design them where we know that they're going to go to 70 to 80 percent load every single time even with tier three technology uh, we want to design it within that in case government comes back and change now that being said emergency standby they get a, just like a generator they get 100 hours of use that they have to document we exercise the pump for all this we did just like a generator and then anything after that they have to document it uh, the generator or pump ran for this amount of time because we had a power outage so on and so forth Honest to God, I don't know that there's anybody checking that, but that's what. <laughs> so I've never met an inspector that does that. How often does a pump, like in a in a backup situation like this, need to be exercised or run? You can run once it once a week, or I would say once a week yeah. at least. And then, as far as like a best practice, should it be integrated into the the primary pump controls to where you know, the, the primary submersibles or whatever pumps are in there, stop and let the wet well fill up and then call for the DBS to, to run and exercise itself so that it's not... I see what you're saying. Just for just for weekly practice, the best thing to do is when the operator is making his change is for him to just shut off the submersibles, let it fill up, and while he's doing his inspection, listen to that pump turn on and off. Because you can manually turn that pump on and off, but you know mercury float switches will go bad. Mm -hmm. So I would rather know that the float switches work. It's going to turn the pump, draw it down, just like you would your submersible. Let it do its draw down. Make sure it's, you know, the time of it. Make sure that there's nothing going on with the pump. Make sure there's no seal leaks. So the exercise should be a manual inspection. That way you know everything's. Yeah. You're saying yeah. manually flip the tip the float to make sure it works is what you're saying? Yeah. Right. So either they could shut, either they could shut the submersibles off or they can pull the floats up and flip it. You know, and draw it down. <laughs> you, really, you got to have a load on it, though. So that's you got to surcharge or, or let the level come up so that the yes, you, you have some load on your. You hands. have some pump. You yeah. have some some float of pump, right? Yeah. If there's no load on it, then what what are the bad things that can happen? Well, tier three, it's not you won't have any. Tier four, on a trailer, yeah, you can have some things in time. It's not you'll get a soot build up. Where you, so on our demo unit, do we need to put a load on it? Monitor, monitor the soot level. It should show on the display. Now, yeah, and let me go a step on, further. On your unit, is that what you're talking about? What, yeah, what unit your... do you have here? NC100. Okay, so what engine? Yeah, that one's, yeah, that one you don't have to worry about. It doesn't That's have a soot a canister. Engine. It doesn't yeah, have what? It doesn't have a soot canister, so you don't have to worry about yeah, it. Yeah, so here, here's what we realized is that um, horsepower is up to 75 horsepower. We went with an Isuzu on our CD150. We, we came up with a, we realized, we, we sent out a thing to our customers and said, hey, how much are you running this thing up to here? And we realized they were not always running it up to 90 foot ahead. They were running it 
typically at 40, 50 foot ahead, even less. Mm -hmm. And so we came up with the Isuzu engine, 62 horsepower. It doesn't have a particulate filter or depth for it to be final tier four compatible. Yanmar 24 horsepower engine, it also the same thing. No particulate filter, no depth. It's got a DOC inside of it. And so soot level is not an issue on that. Mm. So when you get to tier four, you need depth? Above 75 horsepower, okay. depending on the engine. It's just a technical question we'd have to work through. Yeah, some of the engines we use do it electronically. Some of it do it with the, uh, the particulate filters. It just depends on the manufacturer that we choose. A great that. benefit of having the backup pump. I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead, no, I'm done. You done? Okay. Great benefit of having the backup pump is they if they have to completely de-energize the lift station, they can. This is independent. It does not function off any source of the utility power at all, unless it's natural gas, depending on natural gas, but it is not tied to it. So it's a great safety factor. To go back to your question, though, Chuck, on can you do it that way? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We can put a set of contacts on it, tell your panel remote start. Yeah. Yeah. But it's... I was just wondering, like, best practice and what we're recommending. Like if we're going to a customer and saying, this is what we really recommend. I mean, because operators, I mean, I, I don't, <clears throat> I mean, not just off, but, you know, everybody's busy. They get in a hurry. Things don't get done. So I think <laughs> most people would, would probably like to see the most consultants, I believe, and, and public works directors would like the equipment to exercise itself automatically. That's why I, I would think maybe that. Yeah, we could set it up in the prime guard panel to do it automatically as well. Um, yeah, but it, what you're talking about was to make sure that those pumps were shoving and had a full wet well. So, yeah, yeah you would need remote for that. But it's not going to start. Well, yeah, when you. Well, it's you, just a timer, just, adding yeah. a timer or something to the. Well, to the in main, the control you know. panel of that pump, like Ed said, you can schedule it to exercise, but if both pumps are running at the same time, you know, it, it can be competing. That's why I say it's just best for the operator to see it because they, just like this flight, they're listening, they're looking for, you know, and, and depending on where the, the floats are set for the submersibles, there's probably going to be some water in there anyway. It, and we're only talking 15 minutes. So it's probably going to get a load of some kind on it at some point. And it can run dry. It's not You're not going to have an engine issue if you run out of flow. It's going to it's going to yeah, sit we're there. we're talking about load to reduce the soot level. Right. So the whole, yeah. <clears throat> so if there's, no, if there's no particulate filter, then that's a moot point. You don't need to have a mm -hmm. load on it. That's right. right. Okay. Yeah, those are the engines that, like, the, the engine on yours, is that does it monitors all that electronically. Yeah. Uh, waste gates and uh, recirculating valves on the, the exhaust gas recirculation to keep the heat up to burn off the, the NOx levels. So that's how some engine ma manufacturers do that. The John Deere's, they've got that big canister, the urea, and it burns yeah. it off in the canister yeah. under load. It, the, it gets so hot from the load that it burns that, the soot off. And if it's not a load, that's when the soot level starts building. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, worst case scenario, if the, the operator is monitoring that soot level, as long as it get when it starts to get about eighty percent, it starts to get kind of shaky. But you can there's a you can start playing with that prime guard. It'll put it in regen mode automatically when it's, it's going to throttle up, run full throttle for about two or three hours to burn that soot off on its own. Uh, so you can manually do that uh, regen process. The original one that the uh, I don't know if you ever heard a story, but the first tier four engine they bought, they put it on a test pond in New Jersey, and they just had it kind of like it along. So it was cruising along, it was doing its thing, and they just let it run. Well, just all of a sudden, out of the blue, it went full throttle. <laughs> it was doing an automatic regen like the trucks do. Oh, oh boy. You, you can't have a pump go full throttle. <laughs> and everybody freaked out. They had no clue what was going on. Uh, and we didn't know anything about tier four engines. And uh, we finally found out that oh, yeah, it's regening. What the hell's that? Uh -huh. You know, so they they realized that we had to turn that off for safety purposes. Yeah. So now we've got to monitor the soot levels really close. Yeah. And it kind of took away our mentality. Um, you know, Pete Snow that he mentioned before when he teaches the class. Originally, it was you know always have some room in your pocket. So you know you want to undersize, the, not necessarily oversize the pump, but you don't want to undersize it either. Well, now, like he was talking about earlier, we got to hit right on the money and make sure it's under a load in that application. We want to be within a 10% margin of error, not, you know. Right. You know, it's one of those things, you, you know, when you get on those weird duty points where you're maxing out a CD-150, <clears throat> um, you know, then you just look at a CD-225 and let it Cadillac. And then if the 
flows change or something happens, they add some more lines into the system, then you got some room in your pocket. Well, now we're going to max it out at that CD150 and let it run full throttle so it keeps the heat, keeps the soot down. And but just, it's all because of that tier four engine. Now, if it's natural gas, don't even have to think about this. <laughs> and, and, and the generator, it has to run at 1800 RPMs or it's not going to hit 60 hertz. Yeah. Whereas, How many RPMs? 1800. Oh, okay. It has to run at 1800 RPMs hertz. to get 60 hertz. 60 revolutions per second. Right. So, um, as uh, the, opposed to the, the pump, we may not. be we may be able to. Oh, so, design opportunity. You, the, the, your your client may be saying, "Hey, it doesn't matter what RPM, you can still run where you need yeah, to run." Yeah, yeah. Let's say let's say it's a design station where that it's 400 gallons a minute. Mm -hmm. Well, we know they're going to go to 900 gallons a minute. Mm -hmm. Let's sell them a six inch CD150 or CD160 or HL150, whatever the head pressure is. Mm -hmm. Handle the 400 gallons a minute at the lower RPMs, and as that grows, then all they got to do is yeah. set the set the RPMs for the higher flow expansion. rate when oh, it gets to that day. expansion. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's our conserver deal too. Cool. That's a cool pump. I love that pump. Now let me ask you this question: What force main diameter works with a dry prime backup system? A little two-inch pump station with a grinder pump, it may not be a great solution for that. It just might not. And honestly, 100 gallons a minute or such a low flow, it, it really comes down to the capacity of the wet well. If they design it, you know, I've heard operators say, I got 12 hours before I got to worry about anything. Uh, they can pull in a VATCOM truck and suck it out three times a day and they're not going to have a, you know, they're not going to worry too much about it. Certain pumps can pump into a smaller force main, but you're going to create a lot more head pressure. Um, it's not strongly recommended. We like, would rather, you know, pumps like the, they don't want to starve for flow. We don't mind the pressure. It's just we don't want to create an adverse situation for that pump. Again, we like to be in that 10% factor of, of best efficiency point. Yeah. Um, the they last question, money, we could put a, put a recirculation, so they'd have to design in a recirculation system so the pump's pumping full and then dumping half of it back into the yeah, pump. Yeah, there's there's a myriad of ways we could, we could solve that. You lie to the pump. Uh, backup booster for clean water, same thing. It's just going to work off a pressure transducer. Let me ask this about that booster application because that would be a flooded suction application. Mm -hmm. So if we're looking at cost and like Jason said, with the, the sound attenuated cover, do we have to have the priming system on the pump? No. Okay. No, you don't. Flooded suction, the key thing is to be under 50 PSI of the inlet structure. So you may have to have a pressure reducing valve on the front side of that thing to get it down. You know, I'd want to reduce it down to 25 or 30 to be honest with you. Because if you get more than 50 uh, PSI on the inlet inlet side, you can blow the seal out. So you have to be cognizant of what how the flooded suction is going to affect the pump on the front end. Well, how, most so time it'd be well, a ground storage would, tank, and yeah, if a storage tank, you wouldn't be have hardly any PSI, right? Yeah, well, 20, 15 or 20, 20 25, just yeah. static head. Yeah, that's uh, um, and we're good with that. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah, anything, Last, anything higher, push the springs back on the seal and flood. Okay. Cavity. Hey, and you get, could bounce it too, and then I'll chip it, and then we're done. But that happens a lot. It does. Booster applications. Do you guys know anything about our 501c3 called Watermark? Yes, we know a little bit about it. We were, you know, we were all supposed to do a um, what was that thing called? Uh, Habitat, Habitat for Humanity. Habitat. I still have a box full of t-shirts. It got, got rained out. out last year, and okay. then um, I don't know what happened. I think the people driving it from corporate. Um, I think they forgot about us. <laughs> they, they maybe we just need to do it. And they were so big on that because that was going to be the first one where we're, they wanted to bring in our customers and our clients. It's kind of on the heels of Harvey Steel. Yeah, and then, uh, yeah, they wanted to bring in, be able to use it for marketing that, you know, hey, we, we are, not only are we doing this, we're bringing in our customers and our whatever to help yeah. with the watermark. Maybe, maybe Bruce, but, and yeah. maybe we ought to do it on our own and then we can just tweet it out to them and say, <laughs> exactly. hey, look what we're doing. I'm with you. I yes. know y'all forgot about us, but we're... I do still have more t-shirts. We're good. <laughs> we're good company folk. We uh, we're doing the watermark thing. Chuck, I, I'm with you, man. Local heroes are what gets it done. So, that's. I am a. I'm a. I'm an elected <laughs> official in my county. I um. I'm a commissioner with the Soil and Water Conservation District, and it's so it's nonpartisan and it's unpaid. So every hour I do through that, I put down as my watermark hours. That's how I give back. Work with a lot of farmers in our county and. 
I have to start prepping for a meeting. I'm about to leave, but man, Bruce, that was awesome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very thank much. You for Bruce. Good, good, very good, good presentation. Thank a lot you, of sir. good I information. Appreciate you. Yes, sir. Great information here. I'm gonna use it to learn, and that was strong. Have a flash drive. I can. Uh... Hey. Uh, yes. Did Jason talk to you about Athens at all? Texas. No, I didn't tell him the story. All uh, right. Well, it, it, we don't have to. We don't have to figure this out today, but. I don't think it was something that came up last week.